The Grand Canyon is a spectacular sight, one of the seven natural wonders of the world. And sitting on the rim or hiking to the bottom, it's natural to ponder its creation. It's hard not to be awestruck by the vastness of the canyon, and many see the divine in nature. Who can stand in this beauty and not be touched by it? There are numerous theories about the creation of the canyon, from Native American accounts, to strict or liberal religious interpretations, to scientific explanations. All absent faith are subject to question. I visit the Grand Canyon about once a month, and I often see people in distinctive religious dress. I don't know if they're Amish, Quakers, Mennonites, or some other religious group, but they find meaning and inspiration at the Grand Canyon, just as I do. I also meet women in hijabs, and I try to be friendly with everyone and treat them with the respect they deserve. You see, I'm not afraid of people who think differently than me. In fact, I enjoy different viewpoints, and it's people who can change my mind who impress me the most. And you'll never change your mind if you only talk with people who think like you do. But standing here, it's hard not to be touched by the canyon and to wonder, was it created by God in a matter of days? or over a millennium by an evolutionary process. There are multiple theories about how the Grand Canyon was created, and none of them are definitive. The Canyon website says it was formed by the carving effects of several rivers that joined to form the Grand Canyon. But that doesn't explain how the canyon is so shallow at Lee's Ferry and then becomes so massive a few miles down the river. A drive in from Cameron may provide some explanation. You can view how the land on the canyon rim rose far above that of Cameron and Lee's Ferry. One plate of the earth apparently pushed another to force the land upward. An explanation that sounded plausible to me when it first rose to prominence a few decades ago is that a combination of the uplift of the land and the cutting effect of the river carved the canyon. And there are still adherents to this theory today. However, it seems opinion is shifting to suggest the uplift of the land occurred before the cutting effect of the river. This leaves largely unexplained how a river went uphill to carve the canyon. Of course, it might have very slowly carved backwards through the uplift, which seems to be the theory the National Park favors. At the start of the movie they show at the Grand Canyon Visitor Center, they feature the Navajo creation story. That's another explanation. And then there was a rumbling like thunder. And the people climbed up into the fourth world. Alternative explanations include biblical ones, that the canyon is God's creation, likely caused during the floods described in Genesis. And one of the newer scientific theories might support that, but I'll get to that in a minute. Notably, three of the world's largest religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all support the account found in Genesis. Now, young earth creationists who maintain that God created the earth over a six-day period about 10,000 years ago, have some explaining to do. First, the rocks at the bottom of Grand Canyon are 1.7 billion years old. Maybe they're off by a million years or two, but that poses some problems for the 10,000-year timeline. And practical questions arise as well. There are countless fossils and footprints found in the layers of Grand Canyon. Why were these animals left off Noah's Ark? And speaking of logical questions, there are no accounts of dolphins and whales going on Noah's Ark. Were they favored creatures that God allowed to survive the Great Flood? Or did the land-bound people who recorded the narrative just not know about them? Now, old earth creationists don't have a problem with the age of the rocks at Grand Canyon, but still believe in the recount in Genesis. They see that account as allegorical instead of literal. However, all creationists get a boost from one of the newer theories about the creation of the canyon, and that is that a great inland sea rose to the level of the uplifted land around the canyon, and overflowing water from the inland sea carved the canyon faster and more severely through the uplift compared to the surrounding land. The inland sea theory could be seen as consistent with a creationist viewpoint. In contrast, the scientific method looks to evidence to support its conclusions. Non-scientific inquiry sometimes has different results. For example, if you believe the tribes of Israel came to pre-Columbian America 
and then search for evidence to support this conclusion, it's not scientific. Perhaps, as Mark Twain said in 1885, faith is believing something you know ain't true. Similarly, seeking evidence that the Earth is only 10,000 years old and disregarding evidence that it's billions of years old favors faith over scientific research. And tales of the Grand Canyon hiding Egyptian artifacts in cities, as found in AI-generated videos, seem to be just that, tales. I've seen no evidence supporting these claims. Interestingly, the men who first explored the Grand Canyon seem to understand the human desire to find the divine in nature. But they also seem to have wanted to deflect the inclination to incorporate the recount of Genesis at the canyon. The men who explored Grand Canyon were devotees of the scientific method, and scientists are the segment of the population most likely to be atheists. Hemingway said, all thinking men are atheists. However, the reality is that even today, atheists in some part of the world are executed because of their beliefs. The majority of scientists may be atheists, but only 3% of the American public is. The remainder believe in God, although as many as one third have walked away from organized religion. The founders of this country, in a time when atheism was all but unknown, were likely deists. Deists take the old earth creationist theory a bit further and say that God was the great watchmaker. He wound up the watch of the world and set it running and then stepped back. They did not believe there was a bearded man in the sky who hears your prayers. And a modern take on this approach may be those who say, God is creation, but nothing more. The explorers of the Grand Canyon were dedicated to the scientific method. John Wesley Powell, a man who lost his arm in the Civil War, but then went back to continue to fight, organized the first expedition down the Colorado River. Now, Powell did give the name Bright Angel to a creek flowing into the Colorado. Reportedly, he first thought to name it Clear Creek, but reconsidered and decided to name it Bright Angel to contrast with an already named Dirty Devil Creek. Now, whether his choice of the term came from Shakespeare or from a then popular hymn, Shall We Gather at the River, is not clear. But what is clear that Powell hired his peer, friend, and fellow believer in science to map and name the peaks and promontories of the Grand Canyon. That was Clarence Dutton, also known as Grand Canyon's poet geologist. Originally destined for the ministry, Dutton instead dedicated his life to the scientific method. Perhaps acknowledging the human desire to seek the divine in nature, Dutton recognized the similarity of the formations in the canyon to temples, and so named them, but with the gods of the entire world. First, it's worth noting that the view most of us have from the Grand Canyon today is from the rim looking down. But at first, there were no roads to the rim. The explorers traveled down the Colorado River and looked up at the monuments from the river. Next, Dutton's naming convention was interesting and perhaps subtly subversive. He named the monuments with the gods of the world, Jupiter, Apollo, Isis, Osiris, Vishnu, Shiva, Buddha, and Zoroaster. Although this was as of yet an unexplored area of the world, Dutton had the insight to make this the world's canyon, not just America's. Interesting, too, was his choice of Zoroaster for the name of a temple. Prominent from the rim, Zoroaster, also known as Zarathustra, was the founder of the first monotheistic religion and is sometimes called the founder of religion. He influenced Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He was the subject of a book by Nietzsche, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in which the character issues the famous edict, spoken to a cleric, Don't you know God is dead? It's also the title of a tone poem by Strauss, used in the movie 2001, and often associated with inspirational views like Grand Canyon. Thus spoke Zarathustra.
Now, was this purposeful? Dutton was a highly educated person and a man of letters and gave the name almost contemporaneously with the publication of Nietzsche's volumes, so it's likely he was aware. Further, Dutton's choice of world religions was subtly subversive. The naming of gods from various regions and eras makes two points. First, it says that religious belief is based more on where and when you were born, not a great truth. And it further asks, if there are so many religions, which one is right and why aren't all of them wrong? Anyway, I'm neither a religionist nor a scientist. What do you believe? I'm not telling, uh, I'm just asking. My goal is not to promote one theory of the creation of Grand Canyon over another. It's up to you to decide what you believe or if you even care how it was created. To me, the Grand Canyon is awe-inspiring and belongs to the whole world, regardless of belief. And frankly, its mere existence is more important to me than how it was created. I admire its beauty and accept the challenge of hiking it. There are numerous theories about the creation of the canyon, from Native American accounts to strict or liberal religious interpretations to scientific explanations. All absent faith are subject to question. So visit the Grand Canyon and take from it what you will. Whether you come for faith, fact, or challenge, the Grand Canyon offers something for everyone. Please share what you think in the comments below, and thank you for watching.